just decided to bring it here. Uh, one of the things that is very special about the exhibition uh, is that Giovanna decided you know, not to cut anyone or anything, but rather to find a way to edit and compress so that uh, everything would be present and visible. And I think just that is an incredible exercise uh, to, to learn, to engage with. Um, I also think that it's such a fantastic first collaboration. I mean, we are a school uh, that sort of prides itself in always pushing the boundaries of the discipline, of practice, of trying to find new modes of practice and develop kind of new forms of knowledge. And uh, to look at that legacy, uh, uh, sort of all there in one room, uh, is, is really kind of both interesting and, and important. And so I hope one of the things we can reflect on uh, today in the kind of conversation is this question of legacy. You know, there is now a kind of thickened uh, body of, of work, of, of, of uh, practices, of uh, kind of history, of all, all that kind of research, and to be able to reflect on the successes, the failures, what it really produced, what are the artifacts, what are the uh, mediums, etc. The other question I think that emerges in really interesting ways is the, the question of the engagement of the real uh, and the city and what that, what does that mean? I mean, it's, it's really interesting to see how, you know, we always talk about, you know, how can schools, how can practices engage more, more deeply with the real? And here you have examples, and again, of successes and failures. And, and so, so uh, how, 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 can, how can we think about this notion of engaging the real uh, again today? In relation to that body of work, um, the question of an expanded practice and, and how uh, these architects were trying to find to open new territories for architecture, for intervention, for ways of thinking, uh, and what an expanded practice can, can mean today in light of that uh, of that show, um, and um, the question of research. Uh, I think uh, the, you know the title of today's talk is uh, conversation with search and research. And uh, we are a research university, and yet I can assure you that most of what we do doesn't often constitute research uh, according to kind of scholarly uh, sort of, sort of measurements. Uh, and yet we are constantly searching and researching. Uh, and so to question that term, is it really the accurate term? I know Giovanna uh, kind of proposes search in a way that, that it's, it's much more akin to sort of creative practice, there's a kind of collage, intuitive way of moving through, uh, uh, through research that is quite different from kind of scholarly or scientific uh, practice. And to look at it really as a kind of creative practice. Um, and then uh, the, maybe the last point is, is one of the interesting aspects from GSAP's uh, perspective, and I see David Smiley and the audience, David is here. David is the assistant uh, director of urban design. David said, you know, when you look at this body of work, the disciplines kind of uh, sort of undo themselves. The urban designers, architects, planners. Uh, I had this thought that the other architect is the planner. A lot of these methods are shared, or uh, and, and I think we kind of come together at the beginning around these questions of search and research, and then sort of separate. So to think about to think about this level. This question of kind of expertise and boundaries and, and how they manifest themselves or not um, in this kind of work. And then um, the last question would be to think about the future of that kind of work. Uh, you know, are we um, at a moment of reflection where there's a kind of attraction or expansion or how is it different uh, to think about what's happening today? And so to kind of help us think through some of these questions and more. Uh, Giovanna Borassi uh, will be journey, journeying in the conversation. She's, of course, the chief creator uh, at the CCA and created the, the exhibition. Uh, the other architect, Kadabari uh, Baxi, uh, who many of you know, uh, professor of professional practice in architecture at Barnard College. Uh, her research practice revolves around new media and globalization. Nadia Tirani, very, very uh, honored to have Nadia here today. Uh, he's the Dean of the School of Architecture at Cooper Union and a principal of the Boston-based architecture firm Nada, where design is driven by the search for new forms of knowledge and the performance uh, 
uh, buildings. Matthew uh, Buckingham, neighbor, uh, if we don't see enough, uh, is the chair of the visual arts program at the School of the Visual Arts at Columbia. Uh, utilizing photography, film, video, audio, writing, and drawing, his work questions the role that social memory plays in contemporary life. And last but not least, the, uh, the designer uh, of the exhibition, uh, the architect, who designed both the Montreal expanded version and then uh, adapted for our uh, intimate space here, Michael Meredith, principal and co-founder with Hillary Sample of the New York-based firm Moss. Their practice is characterized by a playful approach to research and independent exploration of materials and methods. So this will be quite informal. Um, we'll ask everyone to step up, give us a short presentation, and then we'll have a conversation, hopefully, uh, with the audience um, all here as well. Giovanna, would you like to start? Unless you guys have a preferred I think that would be great. Like, 
putting in evidence this, this uh, two attitudes that are to be very uh, different. Uh, somehow this search is, uh, even if we're used, uh, obviously we become Google uh, system, um, it's linked to um, databases. So somehow whatever you will search here, someone has actually organized it in a certain way. And, and so whatever you will find is always because you find because there is a, what's named in that way or what's orga pre-organized by someone. So somehow it's like searching in a, in a kind of structure that is defined by someone. And what I find refreshing of this is that in reality, this other way of researching is actually more interesting to me because it has this um, spontaneity or intuition of constructing a kind of intellectual connection or other connection that this other this database cannot provide to us. So I think the work um, I'm trying to do, we try to do at CCA, and I think it's also in the exhibition, is really about using this kind of double um, system, continuously going and kind of organizing information and also deconstruct this organizing information to create another discourse or another um, uh, yeah, intellectual construction around this, these things. Um, the CCA, the, the way we even be, we, we, we kind of define the institution in this moment as a research museum. Uh, so everything is actually very driven from research, and that is one of the challenges we have in, in when we um, collect or we archive, we collect archives or anything for the collection. And also in this new perspective where everything that we do is becoming researchable. So also every lecture we do become part of the archive. Uh, and so we are becoming very conscious in what we do because this will also um, impact, let's say, this scholar research that will be done using our collection in the next year. So the, the main discussion we have now is like, what is important to keep now that is relevant for, let's say, all this audience that will want to come to see this, the, the collection or research this is in, in the next years. So, the, the, uh, one of the uh, main uh, interests for me in, in doing this exhibition was also about showing these different research methods and how these people came about to um, produce content uh, using a very different uh, approach, very different attitude, and um, somehow, um, coming back to your point, uh, a model of like what, you know, this interest, like all these groups that had a very specific interest can be in a city or can be um, other, you know, what is the education, how you, and, and then have a kind of focused research that is in, in uh, and somehow I understand if I'm an architect, not an academic, so I will do research in the same way that you actually have a kind of um, precise scope in, in, in what you are looking for, therefore you create the tools and the way you will have to find um, Finding in the research to arrive at that, that kind of uh, result. And so um, I think the selection we, we have done and you will see is about a very inventive uh, way of uh, using different tools, using different, uh, 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 all kind of, uh, you know, maybe a bus tour can be a way of uh, understanding how the city is. Maybe it is a TV series that you have to move to maybe people participating in a project, maybe it's a, um, you know, as Ungers has done, like doing a, a, a tour with his family to visit all the continents here in North America to understand different idea of social connection and so on. So it's also, uh, for me, I mean, wants to be also refresh, refreshing ideas about also not only the idea that architecture should expand the field, but also using all kind of possible tools to arrive to a kind of different result. So I think I just want to throw these ideas and I think others have many more things to say.
was here at the Lord for some of the big fans, and, and I would always say that, you know, just tracking even the work through websites, publications, um, everything, it's always been very inspiring, all the very many projects that, that are some of us have been following over the years. So it's really, really nice to um, see them across, um, across the, the room here. Um, so we were all asked to uh, present uh, or potentially talk about a case study from our own uh, projects, I guess, to talk about really this question of, of the other architect. Um, and so I think that while going through some of the descriptions of the exhibition and, and the kind of do the documents, of course, the word the word building keeps appearing again and again. And you know, so the word is beyond building, not building, avoiding building. Um, and I think that that's something that um, I feel like is the kind of underpinning uh, of a lot of the projects that. Uh, that are presented here, but also in some of the descriptions that I saw on the website and, and some of the things I read. Um, so I am going to come back to what's on the screen, but um, just for the kind of our discussion today, um, the term actually I want to add to it, and perhaps it's already there, I don't know, maybe you'll tell me, is that the other architect un unbuilds. Um, and I like this kind of notion of unbuilds um, as the sort of idea of unbuilding, not just as uh, demolishing, uh, although I think if you look up on the um, Google search or even the dictionary definition, unbuilding is always usually associated with demolishing, but it's also associated with dismantling, taking things apart, um, unbuilding really as a kind of a productive strategy, unbuilding to really reconstruct, unbuild to reconstruct something else. Um, so this is the idea I kind of want to put forward um, as, as a notion of what can that mean? I think the other architects are always defining and redefining architecture through a lot of the different terms that are already part of this exhibit. And I want to add kind of unbuilding as another thing that needs to be redefined. I don't necessarily know that actually, um, you know, what that means, but I think that also it connects to this idea that um, Amal already uh, mentioned in her introduction is this idea of engagement with the real. So this sort of, I think the idea of unbuild also connects to that. Um, and so I'll come back to this project in a minute, but uh, building is something we've been thinking a lot about uh, with also an advocacy group that I founded with uh, Mabel Wilson called Who Builds Your Architecture. And um, this is this was already made an appearance in the show, and I think there's also a video of my collaborator um, Mabel Wilson and Jordan Carver um, discussing our work uh, with who builds our architecture. So um, hopefully people um, here um, will have a chance to see that. So I'm not going to talk about that. But what I um, wanted to talk about was a project that has been kind of on a back burner for me and, and, and has sort of started again this, this summer. Um, and the project is called Drawn to Redraw. And it's in collaboration uh, uh, also with me who did Dixit, who's another architect based both in uh, Nepal and New York. Um, so the two images you saw, um, these are actually very long 20-foot um, um, drawings, and therefore you see the compressed versions um, here, not so clear, but I think as I go through it, and there are just a few um, slides, uh, it hopefully will become apparent. Um, so drawn to redraw, um, redraws existing works of architecture of making apparent histories otherwise hidden, obfuscated, or ignored by extending the adjusting by extending and adjusting the formal and spatial logic of the project at hand. The, resu the resulting drawings play with the design of the original but chart a radically alternate course. Uh, the first project, if you haven't already guessed, is the 9/11 memorial. Um, so the top things that are cutting off are the top two square pools of the 9-11 memorial that are based on the footprint, footprints of the uh, World Trade Center um, that came down, the Twin Towers. Um, in that memorial, the names of the dead from 9-11 attacks ring the two memorials at ground zero in a close loop. This is the week I feel like we should perhaps be <laughs> thinking about all this again. Um, the memorial is re, um, in this project. The memor memorial is redrawn and expanded to include uh, names of Afghan, American, and Iraqi casualties, 
um, both civilian and military um, following the 2003 US invasion of um, Iraq. The names are assembled in a spiral tracing the perimeter of the memorial and extending uh, underneath them. So this whole uh, spiral of name is imagined as a continuation of the existing memorial going underneath. Um, the first tower, Tower 1, the first spiral, the American names um, line the floor while those of Iraqi casualties are along the ceiling. As of the latest drawing, a few months back, the American names in yellow, you can see it this year, um, the American um, military who died in yellow reached five levels down and Iraqi names in sign um, extend down to 14 levels. In the second tower, the American names under the footprint of the second spiral are similar as to Tower 1. This is the one here. Um, but in this case, the American, uh, uh, the American names are limited to the American military pers personnel killed in Afghanistan war. Um, and the anonymous names of the Afghan dead lie in the ceiling of the second spiral. Um, because the names of the Afghan casualties are even less clearly known than the Iraqi uh, civilian individual, uh, Iraqi civilians, the individual names are entirely entire replaced by the anonymity of numbers. So the second spiral, all the blue, what you see, are actually um, the numbers spelled out in Arabic from uh, one, two, three, four, just counting. Um, Again, and it's a kind of an infinite uh, loop that where the names can always be added. Um, we can talk later why Arabic, why not Pashto, Dari, etc. But right now they're in Arabic. Um, so this year you can see the American names on the ground, the um, Iraqi names on the ceiling, and then there's just a little. Right now, the government has a new redevelopment plan, 
and they're going to be replaced with a world-class convention center. Um, these iconic projects, um, as I mentioned, designed by Raj Raval, they were completed in 1972 uh, for Asia 72, an international trade fair. Uh, the project was selected from um, an architectural competition. This is a more recent photograph. Uh, these uh, iconic structures uh, are built with concrete space frame. Um, they're square plans um, that allow different sizes, modules that were initially designed that it could be expanded and um, added to as, as needed. Um, the structures are also well known for the hand port um, cast on site concrete space frame. Um, steel members were at that time too expensive for the government, even steel joints were not possible. So building a, a kind of a space frame out of um, hand poured concrete is, is, is quite a feat. Uh, so this space frame allows a clear span of almost 80 meters. Um, height varies from 3 meters to 30 meters. Um, designed as a hall for uh, display of numerous objects um, such as um, books, tractors, bulldozers, aircrafts, trains. There really is a, a record of all of the exhibitions that were displayed in, the, in, this, in these halls, but it's really, the scale of it is incredible. And um, I think that it's, you know, right now they are really underused, if not just uh, lying empty. And we will see, the last I heard, the redevelopment plan is going ahead. They are scheduled to be demolished. Uh, but I continue the project again with drawing and redrawing of uh, this structure. I don't know where it's going, we'll see where it leads. Um, one of the things I'm really interested in is actually um, making physical models and taking the sort of casting idea, the idea that how do you then actually build with new kind of forms of smaller models that are repeating the sort of idea of casting in concrete and then kind of uh, making them again. So, I just sort of, um, I'm not sure if it really connects to <laughs> some of the things you're talking about, but I wanted to use this as a case study of a project that's very much in progress, in spirit of the exhibition that just shows lots of documents, sketches, letters, diagrams um, that are associated with all different projects. Um, but I do hope we can also discuss unbuilding as a more general term, but also as an active one, an active one that redefines works of architecture.
of um, what uh, is entailed in so-called artistic research. And um, I'll just start with, I, I thought of what I want to present to you and selected what I want to present um, in terms of methodology, primarily. And um, I decided I would quickly uh, show you, flip through an artist book that I made a few years ago. Uh, when I was invited to do a project at the Des Moines Art Center in Iowa. I am from Iowa. And uh, the Des Moines Art Center was, growing up for me, this was the art museum. It was the only one I really knew until later when I made it to Chicago, Minneapolis, but still within the Midwest circuit. And it's an interesting situation there, which I didn't realize, of course, as a child, but um, going back as, a, as an adult and then being invited to do a survey exhibition there, uh, a lot of things became very clear to me working inside the institution. It's architecturally interesting. It's a three-part museum uh, of almost equal proportions between the original Saarinen building from 1948, uh, IMPA edition from the 60s, and then uh, Richard Meyer edition from the 80s, I think. I don't have the date on that. Um, and when, as I began thinking about utilizing the, my own experience with the institution and the museum, um, several questions that I do try to work with in most of my work about the status of art came to mind. Uh, especially the institutional role of caretaking and how, if we maybe could all agree on a kind of provisional definition of art, a very basic premise that art could be anything that we designate and use as such, then of course uh, art institutions uh, have a, a certain gravity in that, you know, in that dynamic. And I, um, same time when this invitation came, um, I was also teaching part time in Sweden in the city of Malmo, um, making regular visits there over a quite long period, working with the same group of small small group of students. And um, one day when I was wandering around the city, I came across a copy of a sculpture that I recognized from the Des Moines Art Center. From having seen it there, and you see it here. This is the cover of the artist book that I made. You can sort of see it in the background at an odd angle. Um, it's a sculpture by Carl Millis called Pegasus and Man. And we're, we're looking up the rump of the, the horse, the flying horse Pegasus there, uh, in the outdoor cafe area in a photograph from the early 1980s that I discovered when I began doing research at the museum. And I, want, I often work with directly with language recorded and written um, language in my work, but I started thinking about deliberately working outside of language and the proposition of triggering language with, with this publication. So marginalizing the written word uh, literally in the book and thinking about how to approach the museum from inside, from inside the archive, uh, to try to tease out some of the struggles and commitments of, um, let's say, uh, defining art on a practical level, and also this this question of, of taking taking care. Um, so let me just begin uh, moving through the book quickly. Um, Here's an illustration of the sculpture that is used by the Des Moines Art Center Library as a book plate opposite the, one of the early homes of the Des Moines Art Center, which was founded in 1916. Um, already in the end paper of the book that I produced, I was interested in this question of flight, obviously this fantasy of flight. In the myth of Pegasus, of course, man or a 
Bellarathon is falling, he's about to fall. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit later. But then also, the, the way into the original, fairly provisional, quite scrappy looking uh, art museum, this ascension up this wooden staircase in what looks like a side alley, perhaps. Improbable horse, I'll get to that in a few minutes, but when I came across this phrase, I immediately decided that would be a good framework for talking about this set of conditions. Pegasus, of course, uh, ends up in the stars, in the big myth, as the configuration of the, um, the constellation of Pegasus. So I began there, and now I'm just going to move through and stop every now and then with a few words. Um, playing off of a kind of terribly subjective free association of what I found in the Des Moines Arts Center archive, requesting uh, everything that, I, that, that could be found that had a connection with uh, the sculpture by Carl Mills. Here's a photograph of the model and one elevation of the Saren in the 1948 Saren building, in which a different Carl Mills sculpture. They were friends at Cranbrook. Uh, Carl Mills had been spent in, come uh, from Sweden uh, some years before. The sculpture in the workshop at Cranbrook. In its, in its um, before it's cast, been cast. Early correspondence and a portrait that accompanied some of the publicity around the sculpture. An announcement in the newspaper, along with the funding, the source of funding and the gift. And then immediately, actually, after the opening of the new building, a dispute, a dispute among the board of directors around the acquisition of works led to the resignation of the first uh, director in the new space. He was only there a few months. Here we're inside the new building, looking at the em empty uh, pool where the Carmelos would go. Details of the dispute in the newspaper, and then the arrival of the sculpture. By this time in the chronology, what started to interest me was the way that it became a kind of logo, a sign of the museum, and even of the idea of art and modern art of a certain type in Iowa. And then in Time Magazine, 1949, there was a brief review of the, the sculpture after it was installed. And of course, this is where the reviewer labeled it an improbable horse. Program of events and exhibitions, one of which is the dilettante exhibition, exhibition of work by Des Moines, quote unquote, quote unquote, colored artists. In this exhibition, it says, was held in the corridors and then connected to a, a description or an announcement of that exhibition in the Des Moines, one of the African American newspapers, then published in Des Moines, Des Moines the Iowa Bystander. The new director. Other work by Carl Millis, who I discovered had had in Sweden fascist leanings, of which there are still a few traces in Stockholm, particularly this sculpture, which 
is uh, actually used by neo-Nazis as a meeting point in the city of Stockholm, or was at the time that I was working on this project. Back to Iowa. The pedagogical dimension of the museum. And then I was quite happy to see your folks in their waiting pool because this was a snapshot that someone anonymously donated to the museum um, after they had taken a dip in the waiting pool. Carl Millis also had a similar arrangement of figures at the Metropolitan Museum in the interior reflecting pool, which features prominently in the mixed up files of Mrs. Baisley and Frank Weiler when the children take a bath in that reflecting pool. Cleaning the pool. This was also, the, uh, I was working on this book around the time that Second Life was uh, in discussion. This idea of flight, and then also another Carl Millis sculpture fountain with a figure uh, on an arch, which is remarkably similar to Saranen's son's St. Louis arch. More ephemera concerning sculpture, and then the discovery of copies of the sculpture in other parts of the world. And then the dispute over how many exist.
so um, coming from a background of architecture in an era where construction was not prevalent, uh, we set our eyes on what we could call a search for jobs in the form of research uh, through the agency of building. Uh, not knowing that uh, there was a fundamental divorce between uh, the architect uh, and the construction uh, industry by way of the separation of the means and methods, uh, one could also call, in a way, all of our projects, even projects of representation, to be located in a kind of moment of research or a focal point of means and, uh, and, me uh, means and method. Uh, for the MoMA project, for instance, uh, our task was to speak to the institution uh, uh, of art uh, and in that sense the installation of full-scale fabrication for the fabrication show. Uh, Riley wanted us to speak to the construction industry about what is plumb, what is true, what is right on the one hand, but also in some way inflect on a history of art, if you like, through painting, through the construction of the perspective and the flatness of the canvas that ensues somewhat later. And so this project in part uh, escapes the building industry to invent uh, a new means and method of stitching a joint by way of laser cutting. Uh, something quite standard right now but in the 90s was a different way uh, at that moment to look uh, into uh, computational abilities. Uh, and in this case, uh, what, uh, if you like, is composed of many customized pieces is calibrated around the flatness uh, of perception uh, and the possibility of overcoming uh, the tolerances that would normally be, normally be associated with this. Now, what I like about um, discussion about means and methods is also the way in which our focus on materiality uh, as the basis for both research and action uh, implicates acts of drawing. Uh, in this project, uh, once we understand the structural malleability of corrugation on one axis in distinction with its structural rigidity on the other, the vertical, we also begin to see that uh, a skin, a surface, uh, contains space within it. But we also understand through this drawing that uh, drawing and architecture is not merely illustrative, it's not pictorial, it's always already an act of construction. And so here research is located at the intersection of the construction of perception on the one hand and the and the construction, uh, literally, of, of building. In looking at uh, the illusions and the tectonics that we set up, we, I have this dichotomy of figuration on the left and configuration on the right, where uh, in the left, marks of construction are smoothed over, whereas on the right, the configurative practice, if you like, acknowledges the unit of construction as the seed, as the foundation uh, of any uh, act of construction. Uh, in this uh, riff on the serpentine, serpentine walls of uh, uh, the University of Virginia, uh, what we did effectively was to study the water line, effectively expanding and contracting the 3 8 dimension, the dimension to uh, expanded, uh, kind of expandable, a variable bond, uh, and then allow the logic of brick, its corbelling, to produce a ruled surface that gives it the ample depth uh, to give it structural and lateral stability. And so, in this narrative, the, the, the agency of structure is expanded by the possibility of both light uh, and, uh, and uh, air conditioning, if you like. I won't go into this.
this, but of course, the next discipline of the research, which for my generation was quite important, not maybe for yours, was that we had to learn how to draw all over again, because we didn't know how to script. And we realized that all that we had done by hand was almost in vain and ridiculous. And so retooling ourselves enabled us to also think differently as we began to think not merely visually, but through code. Most of you have already uh, uh, sort of skipped over that point. The separation, of course, between uh, the construction and ind the industry and ourselves was discovered here in a job that had a budget of $250,000. Uh, this Hookaden, of which came in at $200,000, leaving us $50,000 for the rest of the 6,000 square feet of uh, project. Uh, innocent that we were, we had no idea why would this cost $200,000. And of, of course, like you would today, we essentially uh, took the project apart, uh, figured out a way to build it by taking the drawing, uh, sticking it on the ceiling, suspending bl uh, plumb bobs, and realizing that we could build it in less than 30 days for $30,000 with a profit, etc. Et you know the story. So, uh, effectively, getting around, uh, effectively, Thinking of the construction industry as a central part of the research is a riddle that gets much more interesting when we get to uh, the large scale, uh, particularly when you're dealing with systems uh, of mechanical engineering and uh, suspended floors and building industry elements that are so overwhelming and uh, essentially killing uh, architecture. So now, there is another aspect of anyone's research which has to do with the obsessions that we uh, operate with. And somehow, as you look at the history of architecture, you come to appreciate the, the kind of inversions of perception when you look at the suspension of Caesar structure, though not in fabric, obviously, in concrete, uh, the way that that uh, structure similarly is suspended, but also programmable uh, in the hands of Khan. Uh, the way in which suspension is optimized by figures like Gaudi, uh, rotated to make the arch, uh, and how that has become computationally so much more uh, effective uh, with the tools that we have today. Uh, and then looking at some of the great works of, of history. This is the flat arch of Escorial, in case you don't uh, recognize it. Compressed because the dome is actually not allowed to go higher because the church is literally on top of it. So what's happening in this image, which looks uh, quite benign, in fact, is that the keystone that we have in the center of the, in the, center of the office is constantly getting displaced until it comes to the ground. For the project of the compressive capillary, we wanted to see what would happen if we uh, inverted this project uh, and uh, needed to also invert the keystone uh, as a way of suspending the structure here uh, with high density uh, foam uh, and a great amount of weight uh, for uh, this installation that, uh, again, like some of the other installations, is. Uh, composed uh, with a series of systemic parts and yet uh, stretched over a site-specific scenario uh, as you enter the exhibit space of the BSA in Boston. Um, and uh, uh, effectively becomes a structure that uh, appears, of course, to be light and, and in suspension, but in fact is a compressive structure and potentially something that could be uh, stood on uh, as it supports. Here, then, the center of the stone, if you like, is evacuated uh, in, lieu of, uh, uh, in lieu of a, a report. The projects, of course, and these are not linear, so you can uh, think that these uh, uh, 
uh, obsessions may uh, kind of bounce around through time. But in the Hinman building uh, in, in Georgia Tech, we were given a high base structure, and uh, in large part, the potential of the project really had to do with how you ruin the space inside. It was already a great building. Uh, but we realized that this would be an infrastructural project. That is, that uh, there are certain wirings that would give flexibility to the ground, but if you think of the roof and the gantry frames as the foundation, uh, in turn, that could become the, the, the element of suspension uh, and through an extension of the logic of the steel tectonics of the space could become the mechanism by which uh, the project is unleashed. Similarly, um, at uh, the Melbourne University, uh, through, uh, under very different circumstances, through a studio space that was never afforded by that school, the idea of tilting up what we know as flat studio spaces into a vertical section, uh, the transformation of the invited studios, the guest uh, studios, into this uh, uh, suspended obelisk that is an extension of the roof of that building. The tectonics of that, now bringing the material explorations back to the obsession of, of uh, suspension, it includes a coffered ceiling spanning about 22 meters composed of an LV, LVL um, construction system laterally braced with triangulated coffers that bring in southern light, uh, indirect light in, in Melbourne. And then through massive timber begins to thin out into veneers as it, as it is suspended, effectively a wood construction that locks into place very much like the um, uh, the, the catenary, uh, the suspended catenary that I just uh, showed. Uh, in that project, the logic of the construction industry worked in our favor, uh, an innovation project that very much supported our efforts, prefabricated the entire project and uh, delivered it in 18 months versus 24 months. These maybe are less important in this context, but in fact quite important as an aspect of research that uh, delivers on this tectonic transformation that starts heavy above uh, and massive uh, in relationship to the light and then uh, delicately comes down to the veneer of a, uh, another form of coffered ceiling for the uh, seminar space below with these uh, thin baffles. The Toronto project currently under construction is not so much related to that, but is related to this idea of uh, double dipping or, or projects that uh, uh, draw in the logic of illumination, uh, spanning, and the hydrology of the building. The entire building uh, comes down to this one moment, the studio space at the very top of the building, that uh, uh, effectively uh, produces the, the studio space that is hovering over the city. I won't uh, go too deeply into uh, that video, but effectively the promise of this space with this uh, structural logic, much like the first and fourth bridge, where two cantilevers kind of kiss each other at the center and, uh, uh, and enable them not only not to have columns in the middle, but no drainage in the center. So all of the, 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 the water on the roof is going to the sides. Of course, like with everything in the world, uh, it is not affordable, uh, it is not buildable, and uh, it's, it's something that is about to be rejected when we suggest to them that we build it inside of our studio. And so the logic of these fabrications take on uh, a, a bigger implication as we uh, uh, do it in our, in our wood shop, uh, demonstrating that the ruled surface is effectively a series of straight lines and that not only can you put chipboard in there, but the radiant uh, uh, environmental system as part of it. And then all of this enables the drainage system to come down and irrigate uh, the landscape. Um, and finally, just to go back to uh, our research on materials and, and maybe where we stand today, uh, if we have invested in, uh, to 
20 years of identifying the logics of construction in the industry on the one hand and material logics that aggregate and break down in accordance with the industrial standards of 4 by 8 sheets, bricks and so forth, we were finally confronted with the project that uh, is liquid and that is concrete, where it's either the formwork in pre-construction that gives it its, it, 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 its expression or, or uh, post uh, uh, doctoring of that work that impacts the way that it looks uh, a la Paul Rudolph. In, in a simple house that uh, is a donut, a courtyard, uh, that is on the side of a hill, essentially this project is about uh, establishing the most advantageous relationships to, to the views, to the sites, and containing a private space in between. Uh, the two wings of which interlock at these two corners and typologically make a, a donut that is continuous, producing a monumental archway as a landscape feature that goes in through the building and out the other side, but a front <coughs> door on the upper right hand side uh, that uh, is uh, the main entry of the building, uh, with this massive concrete beam uh, effectively that cantilevers. Uh, out over the entry. The reason I'm showing you this actually goes back to uh, two modalities of research that we were interested in and, and how to formulate ideas about concrete through them. Knowing fully well a history of very interesting construction and form work that even lives on until today. The first one has to do with uh, one's computational abilities to produce optimal form, form work that can represent, if you like, in the classical sense, that you produce from the smoothness of concrete, from its liquid state, into a form of rustication to manifest the depth and the weight uh, of that concrete. That's uh, philosophically one modality of research, completely different than this other one, where the smoothness of the interior gives way to cast elements of aggregates, and that aggregate becomes the constitution of that concrete wall, and as it escapes the building and goes into the landscape, effectively uh, changes the constitution of that aggregate to become the very stone walls of the uh, property lines uh, in, in France. Uh, these two projects come together in one uh, building. Uh, I end then with these three images. Uh, innocently, some 30, 40 years ago, I discovered on my, in the Rome program why Roman streets look like uh, the way they do. I didn't understand why they were arched until I realized that somebody has to build this and the reach of their arm is really the, uh, the, the, an index of its construction system. And to think that for over 2,000 years, even what we're doing today as we tag is effectively the same, at least con conceptually. Uh, but something is happening right now uh, in, in the context of the nanoscale of research of materiality and the reconstitution or the eradication of the structural unit in construction through 3D printing, where all of a sudden the the delaminations that we conceive of buildings in terms of different uh, building performance elements uh, and the, the kind of construction lines that we assume come in building blocks uh, may be eradicated. Uh, if we can come around to address these issues, then everything I've presented to you so far will become irrelevant. Thank you. <laughs>
this in this context, I would say research is a term uh, sort of achieved a kind of cachet in the, in the field, and especially in academia, let's say since 2000s. With the, as we witnessed a kind of double rise in the field of both, let's say, history over theory and technology over design. These two completely different, let's say, models of working and thinking sort of reinforce themselves through the idea of research. And I would say nowadays we're at a different, kind of different point where both maybe uh, at a harder time for me to speak about history, let's say, but like um, at least technology is in doubt. Let's say technology as a progressive project I think is in crisis at some, at some level. Um, it's all show, this is where we, I can't stand uh, not having a mouse, but try my best. This is a, a kind of working website, so keep that in mind. It's also it's a little big. We're in the process of. So I'll show two projects that sort of represent. Um, Perhaps two sides of this, let's say technology through, let's say, thinking about parametric or coding or science, like the scientific project in architecture, which sort of displaced the idea of design or, uh, let's say, previous painterly models, compositional models of architecture. So, let's say from a history side, I'll just show two projects that we do in the office. One is these reproductions. Um, we worked on the kind of reproductions of fake reproductions in a way of, of other people's designs. So this is supposedly a scented candle designed by Adolf Loos. And then we will write a story about the kind of history of it, which some of which is is um, true and some of it isn't. And sort of playing with disciplinary history. So Loos and Hoffman were always a kind of split in the field for you had to choose. And we sort of collapsed into some other space. Um, and the other one, I'll just show some software if I can go backwards. Can't stand using other people's computers. You get bound up in your own apparatuses, for sure. Like I cannot. So sorry. Watch me scroll. So let's say uh, software stuff. So we also worked at the same time, I think, relatively uh, early on with like, projects of coding and using video game physics engines through processing to this sort of main form. So we would um, watch something briefly, I guess, from the background, um, start to
Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, what was interesting about when Giovanna was thinking about putting together the panel, it was clear that we wanted the panel to be a kind of response, not a direct response, but a sort of indirect response to everybody's own work. Uh, and even though all of your work and practices is obviously quite uh, different, I was intrigued by the fact that uh, search uh, goes through drawing and all of, all of your kind of practices, and, uh, whether it's uh, visualization uh, of making the visible visible with your kind of inverted uh, uh, sort of memorial for the blockade center, um, I think uh, the notion of uh, this kind of, your beautiful book is a kind of drawing of free association, of collaging all these moments together. Uh, and uh, um, Giovanna, a curator is also drawing these connections between uh, pieces and parts and texts and stories uh, and, and kind of a visual documentation. Uh, and, and obviously Nader, in your practice, especially early on, the kind of the line becomes a fold very literally, and you talked about so this kind of uh, uh, drawing as a kind of form of research, uh, connect, connecting very literally to kind of construction. Um, and I think your visualizations are obviously a kind of form of search and, and research. So, so the drawing kind of cut, cuts across. Um, and, uh, uh, and in various forms, also this kind of engagement with the real, whether it's the material realities of building and construction, uh, the politics uh, of memory and, and actual life and, and death, uh, and your kind of everything uh, is research, or your daily notes. This is a beautiful story of someone who's going to take the plane, so this is a very um, uh, clear sense of uh, reality. And the last is uh, kind of following on this notion of free association that Matthew, your book, has. It's free association in general, there's a kind of fictional uh, quality to the searches and researches that uh, architects do. Um, that maybe, to, to, kind of going back to my initial question, in a research university, uh, we claim to do research and yet it fails to, uh, to kind of meet the criteria of uh, actual evidence and, and, and scientific research and etc. Uh, so, and yet it produces its own realities and so maybe to uh, sort of connect a little bit uh, the exhibition to your work in terms of this, of this kind of research as, as fiction, as creative practice, as a, a free association that uh, opens up sort of new possibilities rather than kind of very, um, and, and the way you uh, curated, you said, you know, I'm, a, I'm an architect uh, before being a historian and so the way you did the research for for the show would be very different from kind of historian's perspective on, on the archive. So research is kind of fiction. Uh, or just to start the, the conversation, because I, I I think that word is very problematic. Let's say I wish we could end, you know leave with a different word uh, somehow, or maybe because of its history, or because of its actual meanings and other. Uh, practices and disciplines? Well, I think also the, um, I think there are a few elements. Uh, one of the things that for me was uh, important also in the, in the research uh, in this show, but really thinking also fundamentally what the search is, is also where it's done, how hard the modality is, and, and I think the word obsession that Nader uses are really fundamental in thinking like what is also the motive and the engine of like starting like kind of research. Uh, but sometimes I, I also think it's really it's like where it is done, you know, and, and I, I understand being in research universities to you are in the university. So somehow the fact that many of these the cases we present were actually they created a, another entity and, and kind of uh, maybe that was a, a way of uh, liberating 
um, some, some of the space to say, well, then you can do it in different research because you create a kind of different space. At the same time, uh, so that's, that, that's it's also, you know, it's like sometimes I wonder if it's like research has to be academic because it's done in the academia and the forest is, is looked into that eyes or it will be done in a different place or with different tools will then be um, seen differently. Maybe even if you use exactly the same modalities. So I think the issue of venue for me is uh, or kind of not only carries the research but how actually where is done is, is quite uh, important. And um, this uh, well, the, the, this idea of obsession that I, I kind of uh, really, as, as maybe as an architect, connect to you know, kind of other area, I think is also from academic research. You have this kind of continuous, uh, um, I think, is fundamental to qualify this more in you know, terms of research, more than search somehow. Um, that, that this kind of this, this kind of engine that moves you to continuously look for that in any different. Um, maybe I can just introduce something rather conventional into the conversation because I, uh, I, I've moved to Cooper very recently but the environment from which uh, I came uh, at least as an interim period was MIT where uh, contrary to all of the ambiguities about which we refer right now they had a very, very clear idea of what they were talking about. And that is what uh, problematized actually the role of the designer in the context of the School of Architecture. The uh, historians have had uh, an incredibly clear set of criteria around which uh, research uh, is done through primary sources, secondary sources, archival research. Uh, and, uh, and even institutionally, the way that you get tenure, uh, the structure on which you write articles, write books, and so forth, is, is very well known and documented. It's codified. The, uh, on the other side of the aisle, uh, the sciences, the School of Engineering, also have a very clear sense of what they're doing because uh, no matter uh, where you are, but let's say in civil or structural, the notions about metrics, optimization and iteration of certain uh, experiments become the, the benchmarks of evaluation. In, in that context, it happens to be not books, but uh, peer-reviewed scientific journals that become the basis for advancement and so forth. But uh, in all of those years I was there, uh, they couldn't get it right with the designers, which uh, not only describes how either they didn't get in but, but nobody knew how to develop a language around which uh, speculation, cultural speculation happens, which oscillates uh, more along the lines of what I think you were trying to set up between uh, history, uh, uh, technology, uh, and those things which have to do with site-specific situations uh, that architects do, which are constructions part reality, part, uh, uh, part fiction. But I, I don't think that um, in a way we have come to terms with what constitutes research uh, in, in any, with, with the kind of codification of some of the things. And I wonder what, uh, what you do here or in other institutions. Well, I think this exhibition would demonstrate that probably we shouldn't. Uh, and in this day, an age where design and design thinking and this kind of speculative uh, free association, kind of creative thinking is becoming uh, sort of appropriated by you know, other disciplines and fields, I think it's actually a moment to revert <laughs> a little bit, uh, to kind of turn the tables around and, and suggest that this kind of speculative uh, sometimes projective, sometimes is actually something that uh, you know. It's I think the exhibition demonstrates that it's incredibly rich to situate oneself kind of outside. Of, let's say. Uh, but that's different because it's discursive, so it produces debates, it produces questions. Uh, in in a, in a world where 
proof. Uh, or but there's no proof in the, no, in the room next door. <laughs> like not a single proof, actually. Well, my question is, is yeah. what constitutes disciplinarity when you can't uh, revert back to the classical foundations of, uh, of certain, certain forms of verification? Sorry, it's a good question in the sense that you know we are at a point where uh, humanities, for example, are not being supported. Right, the kind of research fund or whatever you know grants and stuff like that, especially in the context of uh, academia, because it doesn't have these metrics of you know uh, what is it going to produce. You know, open. I mean. Know, how do you doing all the grant proposals? You know, you sort of have to in in kind of humanities, arts, social arts, right? You, you know, you, you are asked to define what you're going to produce at the end. Whereas, it, I think within the university, the, you know, that's something that really needs to be protected. That you know, your work is supported for the research you will do, not necessarily what you will produce at the end, or you know, what is the kind of uh, you know, and, and I think that, that it's, you know, and especially in architecture, because I think this exhibit shows, I think, in many different ways, um, the kind of range um, of, you know, even small interventions potentially, uh, it could just be a bit, can have a, a large um, impact as a kind of a cultural question or a cultural practice. So I think that, I mean, at least in, you know, research in, Academia, I think people are, you know, trying to say, well, what about, you know, how do, what do we talk in arts and sciences? Certainly, in this university, you know, there has to be a lot of talk about, you know, what does it mean to do humanities or interdisciplinary research where the metrics that, you know, are used for engineering or science, you know, are like, there's a different metric that needs to be performed. I mean, research seems to be bound up to some degree in a kind of very progressive uh, project in the field. So for me, I, I do think that we're at a moment, at least I feel it, so it's not really hard to metric, um, where, let's say, people young, we can put it in generational terms, which I don't know why you do that, but like, <laughs> but like then, um, the kids today, I think that they don't believe that, let's say, technology has made things better, or that, like, the, even in a way that, let's say, that we have witnessed sustainability, even if you think of technology in a very broad sense, like the parametrics, the, the computational models, sustainability, um, social media, whatever, it hasn't necessarily produced a utopian project, it's produced a kind of Dystopian, and that's why models or something else. That's why you see kids today like they'll take robots and they'll make piles of crap or something out of with you know, using the most advanced technologies to produce things that just look like junk cubes, or using let's say misusing history to, for the same kind of way to the same ends to produce some sort of ad hoc you know thing that might not make any sense kind of and and there's a kind of, there is at this moment a of rethinking going on implicit within the field through through like what, what kind of models are now viable. Um, I think I mean all the reality is all this stuff coexists and it just all keeps go, going. But I, I think the most interesting models that, that are going on, people that we're looking at, there's a real rejection of technology. Like the, I have never seen in reviews, and a lot of this stuff is just personal anecdote. The way I would you know, or my own goodness. Witnessing this firsthand is, you know, I, the rise of painting again is crazy to me. You see more people bringing paintings back into the studio to show that as a kind of compositional thing. And we, it could be a problem that we're going too far the other way as well. Now. Like this rejection of technology could be too, too great. So, are you seeing painting coming back? The visual arts. Uh, yeah, I think there's that the perception. Um, although I think, like the death of cinema, it's yes. been with us yes. since the beginning. But but it's, I think the reason that, that we ask those questions is because of our changing relationships so with other people. Um, but I think this 
this question of, of a knowledge that doesn't have clear metrics is a very interesting one in terms of, uh, yeah, asking ourselves what we're doing. That's why I began with a sort of reminder that, uh, as you all did as well in your fields, about uh, artists being people who do always do research, and, but in different, in different ways. Um, as opposed to research as an aesthetic that's used, uh, or research as a subject in an art, artistic practice. Uh, I'm probably guilty of both, but um, that back and forth is interesting to me. Um, I think also just coming back to the, the title of, of the panel today, that reminder that, that research is a secondary search of some kind, and even how I use that is, is quite interesting to me about um, that we're looking for something, and that it's actually that uh, action that is privileged, and that's how I feel. Understand what are the limits of you know what, what we can do as architects, whether other architects or not. There are limits. I think that is a very interesting question, uh, and I think it's also a problem of labels with institutional critique having had several iterations and formations that we associate with those moments, and then there's always the problem of something sounding dated. Um, but I think something that's less considered is how institutions appear differently than they did at those other moments. So. Um, it's, you know, we, it's not just a matter of going back to an older practice or terms, but figuring out, because I'm not sure what else there is other than institutional critique in navigating life at all levels. So I think it's much more about figuring out how institutions have or haven't changed and how they appear to have changed and what those relationships are. And I think that's also how I read, you know, even at our level in the classroom, um, a lot of social and political questions that are influencing how we speak to each other in the classroom and so on. I think it's hard to speak about the avant-garde today, if only because, not only because it's a historical category, but it, its resonance had weight because of the hegemony of a certain cultural consensus against which it read. Uh, in the context now, after, you know, I don't know, 30, 40 years where ideas of difference have been already absorbed uh, and uh, commodified and become part of uh, everyday practice, despite the radical conservatism of the world in which we live, uh, it means that I don't know, maybe the, the role of the image is not, is not the same as it was you know, 80 years ago. It, the, the role of uh, the building in the context of another fabric is no longer the same. So it, it cannot operate in the same way. I'll also add, I thought it was really, just to sort of try to link those two, last two comments together, I, I think it's really interesting but think about institutions now. And you were saying how it's changed. And one, one thing for me, as you were saying that, I was thinking is that um, since the of our, perhaps, one thing that's shifted is that we are, everyone has become an institution. We are all institutions individually, as much, and it's like, you know, we all have our social uh, media accounts and monitoring and whatever it is. Everyone has, has become an institution. So even locating the institution, institutional critique has become a very fraught enterprise. It's a very slippery one. But I, I think at the same time it is, and maybe this also is the, the, the way you're talking about the, the dissolving from the other side of the context. Um, at the same time it's still there and we still do it. So there's that one side where it's all very slippery. And at the same time every day as architects we are making decisions. And we are uh, making value judgments. 
reaching this or that. And so it still exists somehow, despite everything. But the lens through which you make those decisions don't need to be framed through the avant-garde lens. That there are other ways in which we make decisions. Yeah. My, my sense, in fact... Do you think avant-garde would just come across as a branding model now? Basically, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically. Yeah. No, but maybe... Uh, again, I, I, I don't have enough distance from myself. Yeah. Uh, so you have to actually place me within this conversation better. But I mean, uh, I find ourselves deeply, profoundly entrenched in institutions. Uh, at least two of them. One of them is the academy which in, in many cases uh, has uh, fundamental conservative tendencies. I'm speaking about, for instance, today. Now after a year, I can speak more comfortably about this. I think Cooper Union is a fundamentally conservative place. How to build research, speculation, and exploration uh, when a school has such profound traditions that at one moment were highly experimental and speculative uh, is a big question about uh, what constitutes value and relevance in this moment in time in the media that we operate and uh, against pressing questions that uh, through which you can have a conversation with the world. Uh, but I would see that uh, in a symmetrical fashion to the practice that we do outside of uh, of the academy, and admittedly, I don't see that far a gap between what I do in school and what I do in the world, but I do see a lot of people separating more and more. But I've, um, I, I cannot imagine a world in which I'm not wholly invested in the institutions of the construction industry, in the loopholes of patronage, and the processes of building consensus uh, when a client group has 50 heads. Excuse me, I, mean, I don't mean to trivialize this discussion, but actually it's through those mechanisms that issues of institutional critique and the revolution of certain working models may occur, uh, without which then these discussions for me would be relevant. It goes back to the engagement with the real. I mean, the radical is to engage the conditions uh, it, well, well, I'm not suggesting that is the real and this is not. I'm not yeah, saying yeah, yeah. what is productive about the avant-garde that you still hold here is its, it's, is its palpable possibility to engage in a certain kind of warfare. Shall we uh, engage with the exhibition? <laughs> Thank you, everyone.